It's time to start a new project. It's her work dress, everyday, servant, maid, whatever you'd like to call it, dress. It's a dress with the most amount of screen time in the wonderful live action version of Cinderella. Yet, here on YouTube and most places, videos about it are few and far between. So it's time to change that. If you missed it, I have a video talking all about the details of the dress. So first step of any project is to nail down what was worn under the dress and then make those items. For this dress, there's a chemise, corset, and two petticoats. I will be making the chemise and petticoats in this video, but for the corset, which could be said to be the most important part of any project, if it has one, has already been made. I will be using the one I made for Ella's ball gown. A video about that corset has already been posted. So with that, let the making of Cinderella's made dress commence. First up, the chemise. I'm using a soft cotton foil for this, and to create the pattern, I'm going to start off with a rectangle piece of fabric, which is 32 inches wide by about 48 inches long. But before moving on, it's time to do some dyeing. I'll be doing the fabric for the two petticoats as well. For the chemise color, I just want a slightly tan off-white color, and I'm going to use Dharma's dye, and I'm using ivory and mixing in a bit of the ecru. For the very under petticoat, it's a cream color, so I'm doing the same mixture of color with a larger piece of cotton lawn. For the second petticoat, it's going to be an aqua blue, and I have got three types of blues. Sea foam is a lighter greenish blue, robin's egg is a brighter turquoise blue, and then baby's blue is as you would expect it to be, a paler powdery blue. Since the petticoat is a lighter blue and seems to be slightly more aqua-y color, I'm mainly going to use the sea foam with a little bit of robin's egg blue added in. The dye process for this type of dye is using hot tap water, and the amount of other supplies needed for this dyeing process is based on how much water is in the dye pot. So you'll need to keep track of how much water you're adding. And then the dye amount is based on the weight of the fabric. Once the dye has been dissolved and has been added to the dye pot, salt is added to the pot. Non-iodized salt is usually used, but for colors that have turquoise in them, it's best to use this globber salt, which helps prevent streaking of the dye. After the salt gets dissolved, I then added calcelene oil. It's optional for this dyeing process, but it's supposed to help increase the evenness of dyeing. Now it's time to add the pre-wetted fabric, which has been washed to get rid of any grease and dirt. Once it's been in the pot for about 20 minutes with frequent stirring, you then add the setting agent, which is soda ash fixer. This gets dissolved in some water and then over a period of about 15 minutes gets added to the dye pot, and you don't want to pour it directly on the fabric. It then sits for another 30 minutes with some stirring. After washing and drying the fabric, now comes more than a bit of ironing. The blue fabric for the petticoat came out a very nice blue, but there are some streaks in it, which is fine for the petticoat, but I'll have to be more careful when I do this method for the outer dress fabric. 
The cream petticoat fabric came out a bit more yellowy than I wanted, but I can work with it. And there are a few areas that have a darker splotch on it, but they really just look like dirt spots, so it works, seeing as this is a petticoat that's, you know, she's been working in. And then the chemise fabric. It came out perfectly, completely even dyeing and the perfect color. Seeing as this is the only fabric out of these three batches that will be visible, I got lucky on the right fabric. On to making the chemise. So I'm folding my piece of fabric in quarters and cutting out a smaller neck hole. Now I can place this fabric on my dress form and go about pinning the edges together and marking the armhole to create the shape of the chemise. Once I was happy with it, I cut along the pins and then folded it over and cut that second side so it would be even. I also trimmed the neckline to be large enough and the right shape. It was a little tricky to visualize this neckline, seeing as it needs some extra width in it to get it slightly gathered up like the original. And then, just because I can, I decided to hand sew this entire chemise. For the side seams, I'm just doing a running back stitch about 3 8 inch from the edge. Then trim one side of the seam allowance fabric down to about an eighth inch so I can create a fell seam. The longer raw edge of the seam allowance is folded over the short edge, and then the folded edge is sewn in place. And I'm using a blind hem stitch for this. At the center front, I am cutting a 2 inch slit, which then gets hemmed. This is to create the center front opening that you see in the chemise. With the neckline, it's just a basic rolled hem, which I am also hand sewing in place. If you take a look at the original chemise, it does look like it's been machine sewn, but I'm going the hand sewn route because I just think it looks better and why not? And then just keep sewing the rest of the raw edges in the same way, the armholes and the hem, all with the same rolled hem technique. Last step is the drawstring in the neckline. As I mentioned in the breakdown video, in some of the photos it looks like a satin string and in other photos a ribbon. I decided to make mine a ribbon because I already had some silk ribbon on hand. Using a large blunt needle, I'm feeding the ribbon through the rolled hem. Just a bow in the front, and it's done. Looking at the amount of wrinkle I've got going on in the neckline, I'd say I could have made the opening a bit larger just to allow for more wrinkles, but overall, I am happy with it. And by the way, I have the pattern available for the chemise with a couple of the alterations I would have made, and also just the diagram for the petticoats. If you're interested, the link will pop up above and it will be in the description below. Next up, the petticoats. I cut each petticoat as a rectangle around 42 inches wide and 4 yards long. 
I'm first going to hem them. For the cream one, I'm doing a three quarter inch fold, then a one inch fold. And I decided to use my blind hem foot for this hem. It does a straight stitch on the inner fold of the hem, which will be hidden from the outside. Then it does a small zigzag stitch, which slightly catches this other fold, which is actually the outer visible part of the hem. It's a bit weird to visualize when you first get started, but once you get going, it makes sense. For the blue petticoat, I am going to do a larger hem. I'm folding first about an inch and then two inches, and instead of machine stitching, I'm going to hand sew this one. And by the way, that one seam which is needed to make these rectangle pieces into a circle petticoat has already been sewn and I didn't film it, but it's placed at the center back and the top eight or so inches are unsewn to allow for the opening of the petticoat. Now to finish the top edge of the petticoats. I've decided to do cartridge pleats for these petticoats. One, because I think it's best for this style of dress, and two, it gives me a great chance to play around with this method and test it out for the outer skirt. So the first step is to create a folded edge where the pleats will be. The amount of folded edge can vary, and my method of how much to fold over has to do with the length of my petticoat. I wanted the finished length of the petticoat to be about 33 inches. So I measured that up from the hem and then just folded over that extra width of fabric. For the blue one, I wanted it to be the same length as the cream, which by looking at this photo, the cream is a little bit longer than the blue one. This would make sense that if both petticoats are the same measurement from waist to hem, the blue is on top of the cream, which means it's going to fall a little bit shorter than the cream because there's extra width underneath it, if that makes sense. Anyway, because of the larger hem on the blue, the amount of folded over at the top is smaller. Once the top edges have been pressed in place, it's time to pleat it up. I wanted to test out my smocking machine to see if this would make good even cartridge pleats. So I started off with the blue with four threads. I found that the double thick fabric makes the smocking machine a bit hard to turn. It did work. It was just a bit of a hassle and I might have broken more than a few needles, which isn't a very fun thing to fix. Oh, and I also lost, aka broke, the lower thread, so I had to go down to three threads. By the way, I know you're supposed to roll up the fabric and it's supposed to smoothly go into the roller bars, but I'm having a hard time rolling it up, just so much fabric, so I opted for a slower method of carefully hand feeding the fabric into the roller bars. After that not so fun experience for both myself and the smocking machine, I decided to try out my second smocking machine. <laughs> this one is a little different and instead of metal bars, it has plastic ones. Why did I think that would be better? I don't know, but I'm sure glad I tried it. It was so much easier to feed the fabric through it and I only broke one needle. But anyway, the smaller one worked better, which is weird. Even with this somewhat of a success, I've come to the conclusion that it'll be best to hand sew the pleats for the outer skirt. The main reason being, the pleats that the machine creates are very small eighth inch pleats, and based on some photos, the outer skirt pleats look to be larger than that, and also just less of a hassle. Anyway, now we have some pleated petticoats that need waistbands. I'm just sewing a tube out of each of the fabrics, turning it right side out, and ironing it smooth. I also decided to give it some starch just to make the waistband a bit more sturdy. The bottom edge of the waistband is then aligned to the outer edge of the pleats. Then a hand sewing whip stitch goes through the outer pleat fold and the waistband edge. Traditionally, you would stitch every pleat fold to the waistband, but because these pleats are so tiny and close together, I decided to go every two or three pleats and that worked fine. And once you're done, the waistband just pops up and you got a cartridge pleated petticoat. 
last step is to attach some clasps to the waistband. And here's a great opportunity to talk about this video's sponsor. It's during these times of being very focused on a project and just getting caught up in all the details, the last thing you want to do is take the time to think about meals. And not just meals, but meals that are healthier for you. So let me introduce you to Green Chef. Green Chef is a USDA certified organic company who offers dishes for a variety of lifestyles, including vegan, vegetarian, paleo, and keto. With their wide variety of high quality, clean ingredients like their organic, non-GMO, sustainably sourced produce, you can feel great about what you're eating and where it came from. Everything is handpicked and delivered right to your door, plus their recipes are quick and easy. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh, and together you have a wider array of tastes and options for yummy, delivered to your door meals. Go to greenchef.us and use code BELLAMAY100 to get $100 off plus free shipping on your first box. Again, that's code BELLAMAE100 at greenchef.us for $100 off plus free shipping on your first box. Something I realized too late, I should have made the lower edges of the pleats, so the lower threads, slightly larger. This would allow the pleats to evenly wrap around my hips and waist and meet all together at the center back. So lesson learned for the outer skirt. And ta-da, there you have it. All the undergarments for this project have been made. It took me two days. The ball gown under things took like six months probably. So I think this project is going to be finished before I know it. I mean, this project compared to the ball gown is just like night and day. The ball gown was just so many layers and so much. And then I was working through the details of what I need to make for the work dress or maid dress. And I was like, is that all? Like, there's like not very many things to put on the to-do list, <laughs> but that's kind of fun. So anyway, the undergarments are finished. With one video, we can move on to the actual visible part of this maid dress. So stay tuned for more videos about this entire maid dress project. And as always, a huge thank you shout out to all my patrons and YouTube members for their support. I am able to do these projects because of you, so thank you so much. And of course, you can learn more about those places. And with that, go into your own sewing area and learn, create, and inspire. <laughs> Would you look at that? I have it right here on my shirt. Learn, create, and inspire. That's my motto, and if you like that motto, I have t-shirts and notepads and journals and stuff like that with the saying on it, so if you're interested, that link stuff. 